Hello and welcome to Africa Here and Now, the conversation that we've all wanted to have. I'm Martine Dennis. We've got a packed show today, mass killings and weekly kidnappings in Nigeria. Who's behind it? What's being done to stop it? And Donu, our very own panellist, tells of her terrifying ordeal. We hear from Belle Ribeiro Addy, a young black British member of parliament. What is a nice Ghanaian girl like you doing in the toxic snake pit <laughs> of politics? I mean, shouldn't you be a lovely lawyer or a journalist or a, a doctor, an ophthalmologist? Do you know, I ask myself that question every day, especially on Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> but first, hardly a week goes by without a mass killing in Nigeria. Christmas saw a sustained attack over a weekend in Plateau State, in the middle of the country, in which more than 150 people were killed, 300 were injured. But that's just one instance. There are multiple cases like that taking place all over the country with alarming regularity. And kidnapping for ransom is a boom industry. Notably, a father and his six daughters were all snatched from their home in Abuja, the capital. A crowdfunding account was set up to pay the ransom, but the kidnappers killed one of the girls and increased the price. Again, just one example of so many. Donu Cogra, you'll know her now if you're a regular listener, one of our panellists, tells us about her own ordeal of being kidnapped. But first, along with Patrick Smith, Donu and I managed to get hold of Chidi Odinkalu. He's an international human rights lawyer who teaches at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and chairs Nigeria's Truth, Justice and Peace Commission. He was described to me as the expert's expert. Thank you very much for talking to us, Chidi. We want to discuss with you what the hell is going on in Nigeria today. Barely a week goes by without there being news of a mass killing or a kidnapping, kidnapping for ransoms, the ransoms going up. It seems as if there's very little security for Nigerians today. That's what it is. Uh, that's what it looks like. But... Um... It's difficult to look at it uh, in isolation. It's, it, you know, it didn't start today. Nigeria's had a long history of insecurity across the country. And I've just been actually looking at the numbers since 1999. And we've had a peculiar situation since, 19, since the military withdrew in 1999. Uh, and a, an incremental metastasis from uh, across the country, really, of the insecurity problem. And... Uh, um, I think uh, the numbers uh, actually back that up as well. When you look at, the, it, there's, the, I think the Nigeria Security Tracker records just over 80 and a bit thousand Nigerians killed in the period since 1999. Others have uh, more phantasmagoric numbers. Uh, other numbers are of well over 120,000 Nigerians killed since 1999. And the numbers have actually grown with each administration. I, you know, Nigerians believed that uh, things were dreadful under good luck, Jonathan. But over 10,000 more Nigerians were killed. Um, actually, uh, about 32, 33,000 Nigerians were killed under good luck, Jonathan. Over 46,000 were killed under Muhammadu Buhari, officially, at least or from the recorded counts. These are staggering numbers, Chidi. And this is despite every administration that I can remember coming forth and saying uh, our first priority is security. We're going to increase funding for the security forces, uh, but nothing seems to be working. Because the, uh, in my respectful view, the issue is not security forces. The issue is the political authority of government. And the first line of defense on this question of insecurity is the authority of government. Progressively, particularly since 2007, Nigerians have had to live with governments at different levels that lacked legitimacy. And when you don't have legitimacy, um, I was just writing over the weekend that actually Nigeria did not have a legitimate government in 2007. In 2007, as I speak to you, the results of the elections uh, in 2007 are not known. So you're suggesting then that the, the root cause of the problem 
is the fact that governments are not seen as being credible, as being even legitimate oh, precisely. since 2007. Absolutely, yes. Because if you lack legitimacy, you've got no hand to deal in a situation in which your ultimate source of authority as government is being questioned on the security issue. You have no constituencies to negotiate with. So why do they lack legitimacy? Is this because of the conduct of elections themselves, uh, the electoral system? Why is it? Precisely because of the elections. Uh, since 2007 in particular, every government has relied on the Supreme Court uh, for its claim to legitimacy. And judges are not elected. Uh, and the jurisprudence, the decision-making of the Supreme Court, of Nigerian courts generally, has uh, has actually been um, dreadful, to put it actually. Uh, when I say dreadful, I, I kind of glamorize dreadful. Uh, that's how bad it has been. Uh, and the quality of that decision-making has actually progressively degenerated into a farce. And citizens know that uh, most of the people that, many of the people, let me not say most, but many of the people who rule them lack the legitimacy to do so. So when people steal elections to come to power, one, you cannot expect them to protect the people or care about the people who have not voted for them. And secondly, people cannot take them seriously knowing that actually the people who are ruling over them or claim the authority to rule over them are thieves and bandits. And this really is the issue. The authority of government has been brought into disrepute. Executive bandits. Exactly, executive bandits. Um, I was going to ask about the arrangement, the security arrangement. I mean, how are the police forces for various... I mean, Nigeria is a vast country. How many? 36 big states. How is policing organised? Nigeria is actually not that big. Nigeria is 9,000... 923,000 square kilometers. And in the stakes, in the African sweep stakes, that's not uh, that vast. Uh, look, Algeria, DRC, Sudan, Mali, Niger, Angola, there are lots of African countries that are much bigger than Nigeria. Um, Imo State in Nigeria, by the way, in the Southeast, which has got a problem, uh, probably the biggest problem of insecurity in the Southeast, is a mere 5,000 and a bit, 5,100 and a bit square kilometers. Right? It's the third smallest state in the country. How did Imo State degenerate? Imo State degenerated because on the 13th of December, 2020, the Supreme Court of Nigeria decided that they were going to install as the governor of the state a man who came forth in the governorship elections, who was absolutely comprehensively well beaten. He did not win any word in the elections. After that, the state has not known peace. In Zamfara State, a state in northwest Nigeria, around the same time in 2019, the Supreme Court installed a man who was beaten in every local government area in Zamfara State because on a technicality, it said that the party that won the election should not have won. I uh, should not have fielded a candidate or the candidates that they fielded. And so judges in Nigeria have gone around collecting money, selling judgments, and installing politicians who have no business being in power. These people have no business running anything. As a result, what they are doing is they lack absolutely no authority to be able to, no calling card to bring to this question of insecurity. Chidi, how do you join the dots between what you're talking about, the lack of legitimacy, the political opposition, if you like, the official opposition, the sort of the mainstream parties and so forth, and then the, the criminal gangs, the so-called bandits, and then the jihadi movements? I mean, how does, how does that factor in? I mean, if these kidnapping gangs that are besieging Abuja at the moment, you're not saying they have a political agenda, but they're just responding to, A, bad policing or lack of police and uh, lack of legitimacy. I mean, how, how does that work, do you think? Let, let's step back a bit. In, um, in 2011, President Jonathan set up the Gajigal Timari Committee, uh, Gajigal Timari, who, who was a senior... Um, foreign intelligence asset in Nigeria, uh, to chair a committee to address the origins of the Boko Haram problem. 
And the Gaji Gautamari report, which is still classified in Nigeria, when you read it, was very clear. Boko Haram originated from a band of young boys that a governor in Borno State had used to get to himself to power um, uh, in, uh, earlier in the, in the millennium, uh, 2003, uh, thereabouts. And having got himself to power, he sought to retrench these boys. And the boys decided no. And, and, and that basically gave us this situation in the Northeast, right? And uh, as you go around the country, what you see is that either as a matter of direct evidence or a matter of correlation, there is a great deal of synergy between politicians on the one hand and the people they call bandits on the other. Uh, a lot of the politicians and the so-called bandits are doing business. These so-called bandits are the people they use to enforce election outcomes. And mind you, uh, you know, the claim is that Boko Haram is everywhere and it's doing all this damage. Bandits are everywhere and doing all this damage. But tell you what, whenever there are elections in Nigeria, those people manage to retire long enough for elections to take place, right? And for all of these places where they're operating to produce results. And when elections take place in Nigeria, precisely those places where the so-called bandits and Boko Haram and all of the rest of them are operating produce the highest turnouts, okay? They produce the highest numbers of votes. So how do you then... So you're suggesting, that? Chidi, that... Yes. You're suggesting then that there is... Um a symbiotic relationship almost between the political class and those that are carrying out these these attacks and these kidnappings? Look, I, I'm just looking at the numbers. In 2019, Lagos, which is by far the densest state in Nigeria, Lagos is 3,777 square kilometers, over 20 million people. No place in Nigeria comes close in terms of density. Lagos produced just under 19% turnout in the elections. On the election day, presidential election day in 2019, there was a bombing in Gaydam. The governor of Borno State, of Yobe State, which is where Gaydam is, and whose name is Gaydam, did not vote, could not get to the place where he had to vote. Gaydam, which was bombed on election day, produced over 42% turnout. Yes, somebody explained that to me. In my view, Looking at the numbers, it seems quite clear that there is collaboration between the so-called bandits or the purveyors of this violence in Nigeria on the one hand and senior political actors in a lot of places on the other. What about the military? Um, this military airstrike in uh, Nasarawa state that, in which about 39 villagers were killed by some military drone. I mean, this is a mistake of the highest order. Is anyone ever going to be held to account for that? How many of those have we had? Uh, you know, we had the one in Kaduna before that, and uh, we've had uh, others in uh, lots of other states, particularly in Nigeria's, um, in the broad area called the Middle Belt in Nigeria, uh, stretching into Kaduna State. Um, the military, to be perfectly honest with you, is overstretched. That's just the point. And a lot of these things that we acquire, you know, whether it's the Turkish Bayraktar drones or the uh, Apache helicopters, um, the training available for uh, handling, handling them is very limited. Because politicians are not interested in governing, but rather in plundering public assets, you end up with a situation in which most places are ungoverned. Even the federal capital territory in Abuja, uh, which is a 7,000 700 or thereabouts square kilometers, uh, is poorly governed. Much of Abuja is vastly neglected. And so lots of people are being abducted. Now, the only reason we are noticing this is that the abductions have left the rural areas of Abuja and have headed towards the metropolitan parts of Abuja. That's the only reason that people are speaking. Abductions have been taking place in Abuja for quite a while. Do you see any prospect of a kind of political pushback from civilians and citizens, um, such as the NSARS uh, movement two or three years ago, where people just took to the streets to protest. I mean, given that, I mean, last week in all the papers in, in Nigeria, kidnappings were the, the big item. Emergency security meetings were being held and all the rest of it. It seemed the government was coming under a bit of pressure then. The government should be under a lot more pressure than it has, uh, in my view. 
And part of the reason it is not is uh, the question I keep asking, where are the Nigerians? You see, Nigerians exist outside the country. You know, when you go to uh, Heathrow Airport, uh, Washington Dulles Airport, um, Kotoka International Airport, anybody whom you see carrying a green passport there is a Nigerian, right? And we know one another. We recognize one another. Right. Now, we actually support one another very well when we are outside the country. Once we enter that aircraft, and start heading back, a, a virus kind of infects our head. And uh, we no longer become Niger we are no longer Nigerians. We are everything, Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, Fulani, Ibibio, um, um, you know, we, we, so the absence of a coherent Nigerian identity enthusiastically promoted by the political leadership is central to why it is, uh, why I'm reluctant now to say, oh, you know, you're going to have an, a massive uprising on insecurity. I can corroborate what you said about collusion with politicians to some extent, because I was kidnapped in 2015 and I spent two weeks with a bunch of young abductors who, you know, to whom I spoke at great length. And they, they told me, the politicians who had sponsored them in the past, we had just um, come out of the 2015 election, and they, they named they named the people who had worked, who had funded them to work, and so there was clearly a problem whereby once the election is over, these boys are put on hold, and they have to go and fend for themselves um, and find other sources of income because once the politicians have got what they wanted, they no longer needed to fund hoodlums, if you like. Um, so that is definitely a huge factor. These bandits, um, or the, the so-called militants, um, I, I, who, 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 have not, who no longer bother to uh, you know, hide themselves, Asari Dokubo um, or Ateke Tom, were the people who were given the contracts uh, under the government in River State uh, to protect oil pipelines. But they were doing more than protect oil pi pipelines. They had a direct access to everybody in the political high command. And at the point when they started negotiating, presidential jets were sent to these young men to go to Abuja to meet with the president. And uh, by the time all of that was done, they had ceased to be militants. They became political wheelers and dealers. They had direct lines to everybody in the political high command and they could do anything. Uh, Chidi, the picture you paint is absolutely awful. Do you think that there's there's some hope? I mean, Peter Obi in the last election, at the age of, what, 61, 62, he was considered a young man. I mean, is it that generation? Look, I wouldn't be doing what I do if I did not see hope. And precisely the people that give me hope are the young people. I, 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 rather perversely, the reason that I see hope in the young people is because they are asking questions, one, that Nigerians are not used to, two, that are awkward and not totally... You know, in tune with the Nigerian mentality of respect for everybody and, uh, you know, obsequiousness to everybody. And number three, the Nigerian society does not have answers to. That means that whatever happens, they will have to provide the answers for themselves in a society and against the uh, natural proclivities of that society. That does give me a heck of a lot of hope. Donu and I are going to have a proper sit-down discussion about her experience of being kidnapped, how she was taken from her house in the early hours by two men with guns and kept in a tiny hut in a mangrove swamp for two terrifying weeks. That'll be coming soon. Now, don't ever accuse Africa Here and Now of only serving up negative stories about Africa and the diaspora. She describes herself as a black working-class woman, a Christian and a lifelong socialist. Belle Ribeiro Addy is a member of the British Parliament, an MP. She was elected to her South London constituency in 2019 and represents, to my mind, a great example of a new generation of British-born Africans who are forging ahead in the UK, but who are also connected to and draw inspiration from the land of their ancestors. So, Belle, why did you choose the Labour Party? Because I'm a, I'm a socialist. And uh, because of the Africa Now podcast, in, in African context, I'd call myself an incrimerist. Um, and I, I don't believe uh, that those values have to come without a certain level of equality. And unfortunately, I think more conservative views seem to seem to lean towards 
the idea of not necessarily needing equality, not necessarily needing to take care of everyone in society, that really kind of Thatcherite idea that there, there is no uh, society. I, I don't believe that's true. I, I do believe in, in, in business. I do believe in entrepreneurship. I do believe that people should be able to make the best of themselves of what they have. I just believe that everybody should have an equal start uh, to do that. And, you know, if, if you if you then go on uh, to be able to be the very best and you end up making a bit more money than everybody else, fine. But I don't think that should be the, the start of everybody's life. Where we don't have equal opportunities and we're not giving and everybody doesn't have uh, the same kind of base uh, to start from. I, and, and I think that's why I'm more likely to, to. Well, that's why I'm a Labour Party member and a socialist and not um, a conservative. So those values are are, I think, can exist in both worlds. One just exists without equality. But the the Labour Party of today, uh, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the Labour Party of today seems very much more uh, to the right, if you like. Rather than being socialist, it seems much more just slightly left of centre. Um, social Democrat, dare I say? How do you fit in to modern day, the modern day Labour Party under Keir Starmer? Well, I think that the Labour Party, just, just with all parties, depending on who the leadership is, um, changes, I suppose, the types of views that it puts out. But the membership and the basis on which it was built never seems to change. We are a party that was literally built by the trade unions, uh, hence why we're called the Labour Party, and the trade unions still play a huge role, a number of different socialist societies. And you'll find um, that regardless of who's in charge, and I suppose the policies that are put forward, the membership um, and the views of the membership generally stay the same. And uh, I, I came through as, a, as an ordinary member, um, I'm now a member of parliament. That hasn't changed me much, I hope. Um, and I, I don't think that will change the party much either. Yeah, hi, Bill. Um, and the, the other thing that is pretty apparent if you look at the House of Commons on TV is just how much more diverse the Conservative front bench is compared to the Labour Party bench. And people explain that by saying, you know, 10 years ago, Cameron was smart enough to, to go out and actually target uh, ethnic minorities in Britain because he wanted to create an image of this sort of caring, all-inclusive Conservative Party. Why hasn't the Labour Party done that? Well, on the, on, in the shadow cabinet, it's David Lammy. Mm. Um, he's the only person right. of African descent. In the shadow cabinet, on the front bench, it's it's a bit more diverse. But obviously, um, the Labour Party has a, many more members. In fact, it, the 2019 intake of MPs, which I was a part of, all of our brand new MPs in the Labour Party, 50% of them were black or Asian and uh, nearly 80% of them were women. We had four token men, uh, new men that year. And that really did change the face. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Bell, of, it's of, still of a party. pint of Guinness, Bell. It's still a pint of Guinness. No, I, 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 I was coming to that, Donnie. I do not, I do not disagree with your assessment, actually. Um, and I think, I, think, I think that's wrong. But I do think we also have to make it a distinction between diversity and representation, which is what the Tories don't do. They keep making the point that they are more representative and actually they're just more diverse. I think diversity is extremely important um, because it is important to see people that look like you um, in all walks of life and to challenge those notions of racism. But that doesn't mean that they on the front bench represent um people of colour any better, just in the same way our female prime ministers have never necessarily represented women um, in, 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 in a brilliant way and made their lives better just by being the prime minister of the country. But, Belle, they can claim, I, I suppose, um, and everyone's been crowing about it, they can claim the first non-white uh, Hindu occupant of number 10. Uh, they have had uh, two female prime ministers, one for... Oh, three, an anna, three. three. <laughs> three, of course. Three, She's three, and one who lasted as long as a lettuce. Pre yeah. Precisely, the nanosecond one escaped me. <laughs> but um, they've also got uh, a black guy as Home Secretary. They've had several Asian senior in, in the senior offices of state. Mm -hmm. um, so there is diversity of skin colour and ethnicity, but I doubt that there's diversity of thought. They're all cut from the same cloth, right? Absolutely, and when you think about it, Think of the types of things they've all had to say or the type of views they've had to espouse to be able to be there. Underneath, they may genuinely believe those things. I mean, I find it, yeah, maybe they do, but the idea that 
the the legislation that you bring in would have meant that you would never have been able to be in this country in the first place just blows my mind <laughs> uh, the, the the past few years that's um, mr cleverly you're talking mr. about cleverly, yes Preeti patel Suella Suella Braverman, Braverman. Um, all, all of them, th- those policies they put forward would have meant that none of their parents would have been able to come to this country and they wouldn't have been able to achieve what they achieved. Now, that's a very good point. It's a very good point. But, you know, we're still terribly impressed in Nigeria that it's the Tories who gave us Rishi Sunak. Whether we like him or not is a different story. <laughs> it's a bit like <laughs> Barack Obama. As we say here, at least he was there. At least, at least he was there. Yes. <laughs> now, but coming coming back to the the nature, the complexion, if you like, of the Labour Party at the moment, Bill, how do you fit in? Keir Starmer is is not to the left of the party. The leftists, I presume, you're part of the left group as a socialist in the party. What are your prospects within the party? Therefore, how does the leadership of the party look upon you? Um, <laughs> what. Me personally, <laughs> uh, well, I was I was going to say you those who espouse your values. Those who espouse my values. At the moment, I think it would be fair to say that we are we are on the outside. But you have to remember that in order to win the leadership of the party, it was very clear the views that were wanted. So actually, none of the candidates, including Keir himself, strayed too far away from the policies that Jeremy held at the time when campaigning to be um, the leadership of the party. So, Bell, Labour Party now, according to the polls, is limbering up, ready to take office. We're all sort of girding our loins in preparation for an election this year in the UK. And we're told a Labour government led by Keir Starmer. What should that what would that look like? What would it feel like for the country, do you think? Well, I hope for the country it would feel like change uh, was coming, um, regardless of who who the Labour leader was, I think everyone's had enough of the Conservatives and understands that we need a change in government and it, it's just not going to work. And no matter how long they drag it out for, we were hoping for May, now it looks like it could be November. Um, you know, no matter how long they drag it out for, it, they're not going to be able to to claw back the trust of the people and they've completely run uh, the country into the ground. And I think it's particularly hard for your average person to watch because they can see the rich getting richer whilst they are are, are struggling in, in, in unimaginable ways. We cannot be the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world and people be people be living like this, people be needing to access more food banks. Um, even the quality of our maternity services have gone down. All of these things are happening in, in a country that, you know, once ruled um, more than half of the world and is meant to be uh, the most advanced of, 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 of any country. Right. Um, what about uh, in terms of foreign policy? I, I mean, perhaps most noteworthy at the moment is the fact that Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, isn't uh, is refusing to call for an immediate ceasefire in the Israel-Gaza war. Uh, so sounding very much the same as Rishi Sunak. What sort of difference does the Labour Party offer in terms of the way it will approach foreign policy? I mean, I I don't personally agree with that. I've been very clear. I think there should be an immediate ceasefire anywhere where we see that that shit, the sheer loss of life, and 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 you know what what is happening over there is awful in 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 terms of how people's human rights are being infringed on, and and you know dare we say war war crimes. So a ceasefire should should have always been the policy when we see a conflict like that. I think the difference is, however, from our leadership is that we are calling for um, a, a, a Palestinian state. That's something which the Conservative Party are not calling for. They're saying um, that they think that there should be one, but have taken no actions uh, to move forward to it. You can't say that you want a two-state solution and not recognise the other state because what one plus zero doesn't equal two. You need to recognise both and then you can have two states, not say you want one and you know leave the other in limbo. Do you, do you sense there's any interest in Africa in in terms of labor foreign policy? I'm not I'm not too clear on that at the moment, but I definitely think that there should be interest in Africa and I think that any country that didn't consider Africa at this very critical time is 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 probably shooting itself in the foot when I think about what's about to happen in the years to come um and in particular in respect to to things around reparations uh and I suppose how they deal with countries in Africa in terms 
of their development practices, power dynamics are shifting. Um, and I think we shouldn't get stuck in the whole mentality of rural Britannia ruling the waves because things have very much changed. You, you touched on the issue of uh, reparations. Tell us, um, and this is one of your, your uh, signature uh, policies, isn't it? Tell us what your approach is to the issue of reparations. Well, I chair the current parliamentary group on, on, on reparations, the all-party parliamentary group on reparations, and we are looking at reparations in, 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 in three different areas. We're looking at uh, as what we call perhaps community reparations, looking at an apology, um, looking at different ways in which we can carry out reparations that don't necessarily involve large sums of money. So environmental uh, reparations, educational reparations, anything that repairs uh, the literal imbalance that was created by slavery and colonialism. Um, we're looking at restitution, the very respectful act of giving giving artefacts back and actually giving human remains back. Bell, should we pay each other reparations for tribalism and um, the things we've done to each other as black people on the African continent? I mean, as we know, slavery existed here before the white people showed up in their tall ships. Um, no, definitely. And slavery also existed in different forms on, on the European continent. But there was a very, very yeah. distinct difference between, I suppose, that those types of models of slavery and, and chattel slavery and the transatlantic slave trade and the way in which it still impacts uh, the lives of so many of us today. Um, they're completely different systems. Definitely doesn't mean um, that they were, but they were right. And if there's anything that needs to be done in terms of repair, I think it should be done. And I think that's why it can't be reduced uh, purely to sums of money, because um, the repair that is needed goes goes far beyond that. And you couldn't really put a figure on it. So should the Italians pay the British reparations for sitting? The Romans sat in Britain for four hundred years and oppressed the likes of Boadicea inflicted their language on the British. <laughs> you know I, mean? I mean, we still use Latin in the law courts, for example. You know, I, I have a different view of history. I think it is what it is, when it is, and then you move to the next phase and things become more liberal and things get phased out. Do you know what I mean? Why do we deserve reparations if Britain doesn't deserve reparations from Italy for the plunder of British resources? Well, that is the argument that I've heard from a number of different people. But as you said, things do move on. And if a situation like the one with the British and um, the Romans has moved on, and, and that one has moved on in a, in a very, very different way in terms of what the UK, um, how the UK changed uh, from there and what the impact of it, of it was, the issue when it comes to African reparations and peoples of African descent is that things haven't moved on. We quite literally created a classification system of human beings to be able to 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 subjugate peoples of, of, of African descent. And that classification still exists in today's society. The underdevelopment, the deliberate underdevelopment still in, exists in today's society. And it continues to impact uh, peoples of African descent wherever they are in the world just because of this particular moment in history. So, yes, if the moment had passed, I would understand why people were saying that there would be no more need for reparations, but Africa remains impoverished. The Caribbean, actually anywhere um, that 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 was that was that was where people were enslaved from or colonized, peoples of color um, remains impoverished because of, of of what Europe has done. And if those impacts remain, then reparations must be paid. But more importantly, reparations must be done. And should Africans who colluded with slave traders not also chip in on the reparations fund? Because I mean, I, I, I'm just horrified. I mean, honestly, I come from, on one side of my family, you know, there was definitely collusion. I mean, it's shameful. Shouldn't we chip in on the reparations fund? I think we owe people in Jamaica and wherever, big time. And I suppose in some ways there are ways to, there are ways to do that. But again, it's not the same type of thing that is owned. And, and, and actually, in terms of what was gained, um, by countries or places where people may have colluded, it definitely wasn't the same. So, for example, we, a few years ago, there was a huge campaign to get an apology from European states. Um, very few of them engaged. Most just kind of uh, expressed deep regret, etc. But you saw 
uh, the different tribal groups coming and making apologies, again, for things that they didn't necessarily engage in themselves, their ancestors may have. And actually, they've, 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 I think about what, what Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, and many other countries are doing right across Africa um, in terms of uniting peoples of African descent, offering visa-free travel uh, for people from different Caribbean uh, nations, offering citizenship, all of those things that in some ways can act as a form of repair, acknowledging uh, the wrong what that was done. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that whilst they may there may have been some collusion, there may have been some involvement, they did not gain in the way that European countries did. They did not take in the way that European countries did. If you have nothing to give because you didn't gain that much, um, there, there's, there's other things that you can do, which is why it has to go beyond just financial payments. But yeah, I, I definitely don't think it's fair. So the evil winners should pay and the evil losers get off the hook. I, I, I just don't believe that I think uh, that the gain was in the same way. And, and so I'm not saying they should get off the hook. I think it's very important that we acknowledge the more shameful parts um, of, of, of our past. But I definitely don't think it's the same. No, it's not. I agree with you. There was one question that I suppose should be asked, and that is, you know, what is a nice Ghanaian girl like you doing in the toxic snake pit <laughs> of politics? I mean, shouldn't you be a, a lovely lawyer or a journalist or a, a doctor, an ophthalmologist? Do you know, I ask myself that question every day, especially on Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I am. Um, I came in as a campaigner, um, and I think I'll be completely honest. I, I never intended to be a member of parliament. I don't even think I even really liked them um, at some point in time. But I realised that uh, you can change a lot if you you have the ability to change policy. And whilst it seems very hard at the moment to seem to get anything changed, um, I'm still hopeful. And that ends this edition of Africa Here and Now. As ever, we'd like to hear your thoughts, what you liked and perhaps what you didn't like. Email me, martine, at africahereandnow.com. I'm on X, at Martine Dennis. We're on Instagram and you can get us on the Africa Here and Now YouTube channel. Subscribe and share, please. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and write a review. It really helps. We recorded this on January the 22nd. Our producer is Anne Busby. Our original music is by Enric Adam. Chris at the podcast company put it all together. Thanks to our guests, Chiddy and Belle. From Donu, Patrick and me, thank you for your company. Talk again soon.